From the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Bracely, presented by a Cloud Guru, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, folks, Aaron and I have always sort of had two rules on the show um, as far as you know, kind of how we gauge guests, how we gauge topics, all those sorts of things. And they're, and they're very simple. Number one is, um, you know, don't be afraid to go out and, and talk about things that are sort of outside of your domain, outside of the area that you're in. So we're always looking for guests that uh, maybe fall outside of Silicon Valley, fall outside of the United States. And and number two, and almost more importantly, go out and find folks that are really, really smart and, uh, you know, and, and pick their brain and see what they're thinking about, the types of things that are that are interesting to them. And tonight, I think we're definitely going to be able to cover both of those things. So tonight, very, very excited to have Dr. Bruce Davey, who joins us uh, from over in Melbourne, Australia. Bruce is Vice President, CTO of Asia Pack in Japan for VMware, and somebody who doesn't necessarily know me, but I've known for a very, very long time from when I was at Cisco, and he was uh, doing some amazing things at networking. So, uh, Bruce, thank you for being on the show tonight. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and at least you've, you've pretty much uh, nailed it for getting somebody outside of Silicon Valley. <laughs> so, um, you know, for, for anybody who hasn't been around networking and uh, kind of all the advances that have gone on in networking from, um, you know, Ethernet way back in the day to large scale things around the Internet to to wireless and so forth. Um, that's been that's been your domain for a very, very long time. But for folks who, who aren't familiar with that, give us just a little bit of your background. You know, some of the companies you worked for, um, some of the places you've been um, just to give folks a sense of of the breadth of what you've had an opportunity to work on. Sure, yeah. Uh, it, it has been a, a long time that I've been in the networking field, although I always like to say I'm not quite old enough to have been there at the invention of the internet, <laughs> um, but at least I've worked with some of the people who were. But uh, So I started in the networking field in about 1988 when I had just moved to the United States and was working for a company called Bellcore, which uh, doesn't exactly exist anymore in, its, in that form, but it was an offshoot from the famous Bell Labs. And so I went to work for the phone companies, and uh, that was my first introduction to networking. Uh, you know, as everybody would now know, that was at the point where the internet was well and truly off the ground, but had not really become mainstream. And uh, then in 1995, I jumped onto uh, the bandwagon that was Cisco Systems, and that turned out to be a pretty good time to get involved in the, I guess, what you consider the mainstream of networking. And uh, and then I, w- I was at Cisco for 16 years, and I worked with a lot of pretty famous people. Um, I guess my uh, first couple of, of months there, I started working with Yakov Rector and Tony Lee, and you couldn't ask for a much uh, more high-powered duo than that. Yep. And, and then uh, after uh, a, a long and mostly satisfying time at, at Cisco, uh, I was actually beginning to get a little bit... Uh, uh, jaded, I guess, and I was beginning to wonder whether networking had had reached its its limits in terms of interesting things to do. And there were actually two areas that stood out to me as being interesting in uh, sort of 2011. Um, one of them was uh, software defined networking, and one of them was wireless. And uh, so, not knowing t- too much about uh, wireless, I ended up jumping into the SDN bucket and uh, joined this little startup company called Nasira. And, uh, and so having avoided Silicon Valley for my entire life up until that point, uh, I then moved to Silicon Valley and joined Nasira. And uh, six months later, we were acquired by VMware. Uh, and I've been at VMware ever since uh, and just uh, continued my career in uh, Silicon Valley all the way through 2017 when this opportunity to take on a, a more global role with VMware out in Asia Pacific came up. And uh, so I, I moved into the the role that I've been in now since uh, roughly March of last year as the CTO for APJ. And that now means I have to cover a lot more than networking. Uh, but obviously, my uh, my roots still uh, still go deep into into networking. So that's that's the quick summary of my uh, of my career from uh, 88 to today. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. You know, one of the things we like to take advantage of, especially when folks, um, you know, are now sort of embedded, a lot of us travel the world to go visit different companies and customers. But but for those that are sort of embedded um, in different regions of the world, we always like to pick your brain, uh, you know, you're you're back in Asia Pacific, uh, you know, you're living out of Melbourne, but you cover, you know, 
a, a pretty wide, wide part of, of uh, territory. What do you find, you know, having, having been in the States for a long time, um, but, but now being there, what do you find are some of the things that maybe if you're, if you're in the States, you, maybe you're in the Valley, um, that, you, that you would go, you know, you guys just don't understand this trend that's going on in, in Asia Pacific, these couple of things that are going, the, the dynamics or the economics. What, what are the couple of things that have jumped out at you over the last, say, year and a half since you've been there? Yeah, so I, I think there's a few things that I would mention. One is I think there is a bit of a sense in Silicon Valley that everybody is just like me. And so, like, you know, I'm, you know, somebody with a software development background. Um, everybody I run into has a software development background. Therefore, everybody we're selling to has a software development background. And, you know, clearly that's not the case, right? So, right. Um, you know, you don't even have to get too far out of Silicon Valley for, for that to be uh, to be false. But, you know, certainly when you get out into parts of, parts of Asia, you know, you're increasingly going to find people who are, are not from that, from that background. Um, and so, you know, for example, we see, you know, a lot of our customers are now just trying to figure out what does it mean to have an application development team as, as part of their organization. Um, and, and, so, and so the other thing, I guess, is that there is also a, some, sometimes a sense in Silicon Valley that all the cool stuff is happening there. Um, and, and so there's you know, plenty of counterpoints to that. Um, I guess one of the, the areas that I've found really fascinating since taking on this job is, is India, um, where, first of all, there's a huge number of software developers, but also there's a huge willingness to try new things and try them very quickly at massive scale. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we're finding is that if, if we have a customer in India, they're quite likely to put something into a proof of concept and then, you know, over the weekend, they'll deploy it into eight production data centers. And all of a sudden it's getting getting hit by, you know, tens of thousands or, or millions of customers. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's sort of the the trend. We, we reckon if we, if we have a, a successful proof of concept in India, we'd better be planning for a very large scale deployment, you know, pretty quickly after that. Right, right. Yeah, I know. I know we, we always used to back in the day, we always used to have this mantra that like, if you could make something work in New York City or, or on Wall Street, you could probably make it work anywhere like scale and, and robustness. But yeah, when you when you talk about India and China and some of these uh, areas that that literally the population is, you know, has a B at the end of it, uh, you know, in, right. in the billions, you know, to say, well, it, they scale up to a million users. Well, that's not <laughs> that's a that's yeah. a huge number in their mind, but it's not a huge number in, in relative scale. So, yeah, uh, that's that's sort of the first thing that always jumps out at me is, is just the relative scale, the population densities and, um, you know, going through this this big technology transformation as they try and leapfrog into uh, the 21st century, get ahead in the 21st century. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to, on, on the India front, like one of the things I think is really interesting there is how how quickly they're going after um, the idea of digital identity for everybody and biometric identification and sort of, you know, things that seem kind of science fiction-y mm -hmm. that, you know, they've, they've actually, you know, well and truly gotten ahead of, of many countries in the West. Right, right. And, you, you know, you start, you start implementing those systems. Um, I know from, from having read some of your work, looking at some of the things you've, you've done about blogs and talks and all, um, IoT has been a, an area of focus for you. Obviously, um, you know, IoT gets into, you know, large densities, you know, population densities, device densities. Um, what is that, you know, is, is I, I've read, you know, people sort of say, well, you know, things like IoT, edge computing is growing faster in um, in Asia, in the APAC regions and so forth. Are you finding that's just because of the, the sort of density of the population or are there other things from an economics perspective, from a geography perspective, uh, you know, infrastructure perspective that's, that's sort of driving, um, say, IoT uh, in faster in, in Asia than, than maybe in other parts of the world? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the data on, on IoT adoption is probably a little bit hard to get your you know, get really reliable data is a bit challenging at the sure, moment. But sure. certainly, you know, when I look at, you know, various industry reports, there's, there is massive adoption of IoT in, in Asia. And, you know, again, one of the reasons is because if you start thinking about things where you want to get access to billions of people, you know, Asia is a pretty good place to, to do that. Right. Um, but, you know, some of the early use cases for IoT are also in things like manufacturing. And, you know, if you think about where, where's, where's manufacturing done at massive scale, uh, well, you know, China's probably the first place you'd think of. So, right. uh, so there's, there's sort of a lot of different different trends there. Um, but there, I think there is this overall belief in in APJ that you know we have the ability to leapfrog over older technology. And so, uh, you know, I, I've been telling this story about how I did a project in the '80s that you know today it would probably be a uh, an IoT story where I was hooking up 
analog strain gauges to trucks being used in iron ore mines. And uh, you know, today, of course, you would you would look at that and say, okay, well, you wouldn't do that with analog strain gauges. You would do it with a little IoT device with a wireless connection. Right and now, you would instrument every every truck. Um, and so, you know, you think about you know sort of you know, minerals extraction type industries. There's lots and lots of that that uh, can can leverage IoT. So, I think there's a lot of factors here. I, I don't think I want to claim it's going faster here than the rest of the world, but there's no doubt the uptake here is is pretty substantial. Right. Well, and and, and like we mentioned just a few minutes ago, any any time you you find anything that does gain adoption over there just because of the the sheer density of of you know volume of people that are there um you know you're you're going to have scale issues that are just going to immediately come up just because you're talking about hundreds of millions of people uh that that could be you know influenced fairly quickly yeah exactly yeah. Um, so in, in that vein, uh, you know, so so in your role, uh, you know, as, as CTO, obviously, you're going to be talking to technologists a lot. Like you've mentioned, you've, you've got to have this sort of broad sense of, of a lot of the technologies that, that you're responsible for. But I have to imagine, um, you know, especially as, as you're dealing with some of these transformational technologies, you know, whether it's an IoT or whether it's something else, um, you know, you're talking to the business leaders uh, in, in that region. How do you find um, in, in your conversations the business leaders who are saying, "Hey, we could we could take advantage of this technology. It could be an IoT. It could be could be whatever." Um, are able to translate that back to the technologist, or is it the technologist who are kind of coming to the business leaders and saying, "Hey, we really you know you, you may not understand what all these words mean, but we could take advantage of this to get into a new market to go attract that next fifty billion users." How do the, how do the sort of business to, to technology conversations or translations take place over there? Yeah, I mean, I think the the thing which is really noticeable now is that at least at the more advanced companies, the the CIO is often viewed as a partner of the business as opposed to in the past where the CIO was viewed more as a, you know, a person in charge of a cost center. And so there is this greater tendency for the CIO to have a seat at the table to actually be having discussions about what can we do to drive the business forward because, you know, say you're in the financial business, you now recognize that how you embrace technology is fundamentally going to drive how you grow the business, how you drive customer satisfaction, uh, and, and so this there's this you know much more I, I'd say equal footing for the technologists in the business. Whereas in the past, you know they were they were viewed you know, a as a cost center and b as sort of an irritant because they never got things done as fast as you wanted. Um, now they're viewed you know at least in a, in a good subset of companies, the technology group is viewed as part of the business and a you know a real partner in driving the business forward. So that now means that. CIOs get a seat at the table to say, you know, here's a way we could use technology to transform the way we interact with customers or to change the way we deliver our products or to even, you know, to change the way we enter new markets. So sort of the ability to use technology to change the business is, in a sense, that's, you know, that's what digital transformation is supposed to be, at least. Right. And I think that's, you know, everybody can say they're doing digital transformation, but, you know, at least a good percentage of co- companies now are really leveraging technology to change the way they do business. And right. that fundamentally means you, you put the CIO in a, in a different position to where you know, he or she was in the past. Right. And and obviously, I mean, we, we've seen this, um, you know, in the States at, at various times over the last, you know, decade, two decades, when you when you get to scale, you have certain business advantages that, that your competition doesn't have. Um, are, are you seeing the same sort of thing um, in, in various regions of, of Asia where the people that have scale um, are able to, to move faster? And so there's a, there's a different sense of urgency because people are afraid of, of you know, getting behind their competition or getting behind the next big thing. Is there what, what feels like a, a greater sense of urgency in terms of implementing some of these new technologies or, or taking yeah. a risk? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that's exactly right. I think that that everybody feels that today it's either disrupt or be disrupted. Um, and, you know, I, I always like the Reed Hastings quote, which was something along the lines of, um, you, 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 um, the companies rarely die from moving too fast. They frequently die from moving too slow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, I think that's a, that's kind of a, a good banner to march under when you're thinking about digital transformation. And so the, again, not every company, but a lot of companies are saying, okay, you know, if we don't do something disruptive, some smaller, more nimble company will come along and disrupt us. And so we'd better be the ones to do that first. Right. And you know, again, I think, you know, the financial industry, you know, sees this happening a lot. 
and so that's one area where we see a lot of uptake in, in new technology. But you know, it's I think it's really across across many many industries. Even the telco industry is I think another great example where um, you know you can have a new entrant show up and all of a sudden they're taking away your market share and you need to be able to move more quickly. So that's, you know, that's one area where we've seen a lot of willingness amongst established telcos to do things that are pretty innovative when that's not something telcos historically have been that well known for. Uh, but they, they recognize the urgency of, well, we either innovate or we get overtaken by more nimble startups. Yeah. And, and are you seeing, you know, you know, from, from when you were here in the States, there was a lot of times when people would say, well, um, you know, we, we should try and emulate what Google does. We should we should leverage, you know, similar technologies as somebody like Google or Facebook or, you know, kind of the, the localized, uh, you know, web scale company that, you know, we would hear a lot about. Does that same type of thing happen uh, there where people are saying, hey, we need to emulate Alibaba, we need to emulate, you know, Tencent, we need to emulate, or is there still somewhat of a, you know, what is what is the West doing in terms of technology and we need to kind of jump on, on that? Or, you know, like, how, how does the the view of innovation sort of look from, from that side of the world? Yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, everybody, everybody here is aware of the, you know, the global names, the, you know, the Amazons, the Googles, sure. um, certainly the, yeah, the Alibabas and so on have, have higher profile here. Um, I think th- that, that sentiment of like, I want to be like Google. It's, it always worries me a little bit when I hear that, because I reckon the number of companies that can be like Google is pretty small. Right. Um, and so, it, it strikes me as it's, it's not a bad idea to, to say, yes, we want to be as agile as one of the mega scale operators. But at the same time, that's a really, really tough thing to do. You know, you look at how many developers does Google have, you know, and, and right. what's that as right. a percentage of their total workforce. Then you compare that to, say, a bank, you know, um, or a telco. It, they're not going to have that same, you know, skill set and, and, and depth. Um, so I think what I see a little bit more realistically is – the, the expectation is either I'm going to leverage the technologies of the, the cloud, whether it's Google or Ali Cloud or whoever, or I'm going to find a way that my internal IT moves as quickly as those cloud providers. And so the bar has very much been raised for internal IT because if you're taking, you know, even a week to provision some infrastructure when the alternative is that the business goes off and gets it immediately from from a public cloud. Then you're you're pretty quickly going to be irrelevant. Right. So so, so I, I think that you know the aspiration to be like the the mega clouds, it's not it, it's no it's probably no more or less widespread here than it is in in the US. Um, but it is absolutely an expectation that your IT organization had better be able to deliver agility that comes close to what you get from the from the public clouds. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, and I would agree with that. I think um, I think we're getting smarter in that we don't um, sort of fascinate about being like, oh, you know, how how can we be exactly like Google? But I, I do think we have seen a shift where people are beginning to realize that, you know, the, the KPIs or the metrics that they used to use internally for success or, or failure are now sort of getting reshaped by uh, by like by the what the public cloud delivers. Now, whether you use their service or like you said, you try and emulate how fast it can be delivered, how automated it can be. I think that's the realization that's, that's come over the last few years um, that I, I think is, is pretty becoming pretty consistent and universal and people are trying to strive towards getting towards that. Yeah. Um, let me, let me come back to uh, a little bit of technology. Um, you know, I, I want to kind of build off of your experiences, um, you know, with with Nicira, with SDN, with kind of this this change and transformation where you're really you're kind of blurring lines, right? So, you know, you had been at Cisco, um, lots of hardware centric networking, very defined teams that did networking, different defined teams that were doing security, other teams that were doing different things. Um, you know, software defined networking kind of blurred those lines. Uh, we get into say like something like IoT where you know, or, or even just anything in the region, if all of a sudden something goes from a, a prototype on a weekend to, to 10 million people, you kind of can't throw security on at the end. Are, are you seeing as we move to more and more software defining technologies, whether it's security centric, network centric, you know, identity, whatever, are, are you finding that people are realizing that that those lines are becoming very blurred and they kind of have to be thinking about them at the same time when they get started or, or are we still struggling, you know, do, oh, well, that's different. So this, 
that old group needs to do it differently. How are you seeing that evolve, especially at the scale that sometimes things spin up over there? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the most sort of positive development that I'm seeing is the traditional silos are starting to get broken down within IT, and so you know we've we've seen this from a number of our uh, you know biggest and more, most sophisticated customers that instead of saying I've got a security team and I've got a network team and I've got a storage team, they tend to say you know we've got a cloud team, um, and and so you know then once you've got that mindset, everybody's job is to deliver the cloud service. And then that cloud service has a number of properties, which include, you know, availability, security, performance. Um, and you, you can't simply stop and say, well, I made a network that, you know, that never dropped a packet and never went down. So my job is finished. You have to say, did I deliver the outcome that the business needed, which was agility, availability, performance, the, the, you know, the sort of the metrics that actually matter for a cloud service. Right. Um, and so while you're still going to have network specialists and you'll still have server you know, and storage and so on, you're going to have, have a different set of, of metrics for what, what success looks like and a different set of kind of operating patterns for how those teams work with each other. So this idea that my silo is good and I don't really – need to worry about anything outside of my silo. I think that thinking is starting to go away. So that's, that's what I think is very positive. Um, specifically around security, I do think there's a realization that we, we didn't do a good job on security in the early days of networking. And, you know, I can find people, you know, older and more experienced than me to, to back up that saying, yeah, we weren't really thinking a lot about security in the early days of networks because the job in the early days was make sure everything could talk to everything. And today, the bad news is everything can talk to everything, and that includes botnets and hackers and spammers. And and so, yeah, it isn't connectivity awesome. Well, I kind of wish I weren't connected to that, you know, that hacker that just dropped some, you know, uh, ransomware into my network. So um, I think we did a great job on connectivity at scale, um, you know, and then a rather less good job on security at scale. And so the way we're looking at this, inside VMware is can we rethink how security gets built into our infrastructure so that instead of trying to bolt on a few dozen or a hundred products afterwards to try to fix all those little weaknesses that were left in the infrastructure, can we actually build infrastructure that's got more inherent security capabilities built into it? Um, and so I think this is where software defined everything makes such a huge difference that you know, I, I, I like to say we sort of stumbled into micro segmentation as a consequence of software defined networking because we made it really easy to create a very large number of virtual networks in a very programmatic way. Once we did that, all of a sudden we thought, oh, right, now you can make isolation really cheap. You know, I can make a single network for a single application, there's no incremental cost as opposed to the old way of doing networking was like, oh, really? You want another VLAN? Well, that's going to take a few weeks. Right. So, so this idea that, that you, know, you know, software changes everything, it's like software's always been part of networking. Right. But the way we provisioned networks historically was very much not a software-based approach. It was a CLI-based approach. Um, now, you know, the fastest way that I can provision a network is I can spin up a, a set of Kubernetes containers uh, or you know, spin up a set of containers using Kubernetes and, and in the act of doing that, I will automatically create all the networking that those containers need. Right. And so like that is a very different way of thinking about networking when you know a, a Kubernetes command is the thing that actually causes the network to get provisioned as opposed to you know, some highly trained person typing away at a CLI. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, let me ask you one last question and we'll, we'll wrap it up because I want to be respectful of your time. Um, you know, traditionally, uh, you know, people people would sort of say that, that you know, across the region, generically in, in, in the Asia region, um, you know, definitely in, in certain spots, more focus on on early education. So, you know, the kids will go to school six days a week and, and maybe longer hours and longer days and so forth. Um, are you finding, especially in the technology sector, uh, you know, always new technologies coming along, people have to decide what to learn, keep up with their careers. Do you find that that focus on kind of constant education um, is is consistent, uh, you know, or, or kind of there in the, in the APAC region to where people – 
Because here in the States, I think sometimes people are, have reached a point where they go, well, you'll learn it. It's your career. You keep up with it. D- do you find that the companies around uh, the Asia, Asia area make training, make relearning, make reskilling, um, you know, a part of, of kind of the life cycle of being at the companies? Does that extend from, you know, young kids to into the business world? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm always a bit hesitant to make sort of Asia-wide sure. generalization. Sure, Because it's... One of the things that's amazing about being out here is just how diverse the different cultures are. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so, yeah, you can think of, you know, sort of cliches about, about the importance of education in Asia. Um, but, you, you know, you can find strengths and weaknesses in the educational system of any, sure. of any country, I think. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big fan of the educational system that I went through in, in Australia and the UK. And um, I'm sure other people could find weaknesses there. But um, I, I do think that this is this is a pretty much a global issue at this point is that you you know to be successful in your career you have to have some way of continuing to learn new stuff and you know i think you know i don't think this is particularly asia asia specific hmm. that this, this in, in, the importance of ongoing training is i think very highly recognized wherever you go um the there is probably a little bit more of a sense in the U.S. that every individual gets to make their own choices and and th- th- you know th- they'll look after themselves, whereas maybe you know here you find a bit more you know the, the state will take a bit more responsibility um, to make sure that people are able to get access to education. Um, but I think you know since I'm still working for a U.S. based company, I'm mostly exposed to, to how we handle ongoing training, and it's a super high priority for us. Yeah. Um, and I, I think you know I see that as being being pretty true wherever I travel is that you can't really survive in the technology industry without continuing to to evolve and and you know build up your your skill set and i i i, I guess i, I want to make an observation as somebody who's been kind of learning new stuff continuously throughout their career for 30ish years that you always have this problem that you get very very good at one thing and it's tempting to say that's it i'm done i'm going to stick with that because i'm never going to be as good at anything else as i am at that one thing um and you know, for me, I would say, well, I got, you know, pretty knowledgeable about a certain set of things to do with networking. And now for the last, you know, 18 months, I've been trying to learn about every other part of IT outside of networking. And it was pretty intimidating. You know, I had to go and say, I don't really understand storage all that well. And yet I'm expected to go and talk to our customers about what VMware can do in storage. Right. So um, it's it's having this willingness to say, you can you can move into a new area where you're not the world's greatest expert and still have some some impact there and then over time you'll you'll get better at it and you know i think most people know if they bring me in to talk to a customer and it goes deep on networking i'll I'll be fine if it goes deep on storage they probably you know needed to bring someone else to that meeting right right Um, but if if it's a matter of like well let me talk about our overall software to find data center strategy then you know i can you know talk about the broader the broader picture so I, i guess the the message i'm trying to get out here is Everybody should be figuring out how they keep on learning new things, even if it makes you a bit uncomfortable to be moving into areas where you're not an expert. Yep. Um, and then you know, the other thing which I think has served me extremely well throughout my career is to try to be as broad as possible. So even though you can only be really, really deep in one or two things, to, to supplement that with breadth across other areas you know, it enormously improves your, your value. Yep. Um, and I, I always admired the people that I worked with in my early career. Um, David Clark from MIT is one of the people I would say is kind of a role model for me because he seemed to know something pretty deep about everything <laughs> to, do, to do with you know, computer science, even though he'd spent you know, most of his career in networking. Um, and, and so I sort of think of people like that as, yeah, you want to be able to at least go you know, to a moderate level of depth on a lot of topics that are adjacent to your specialty. Yep. Yep. No. And I, and I think that's great advice. I, I think, you know, one of the things we've always said on this show is that uh, the technology will always change. Um, you you will go through some periods as you're trying to learn some through things where you will be you'll be very humbled because you, you feel like, you know, you, you failed or you, you're not learning it as fast as you'd like to. And then I think you're always, you know, a little bit pleasantly surprised at at once you start learning it, um, how just applicable the skill of learning how to learn, knowing how to learn um, becomes useful, you know, for, for any net new technology. And then, you know, being willing to, to go pick the brain of people that, that probably know it more than you do and, and are, you know, most likely willing to teach you because they went through the same process. So I think that's the advice that you gave, just the, the guidance 
guidance on you know being willing to, to constantly be learning is is, is great. Um, last thing before we before we wrap up, um, uh, we'll be publishing this here in a day or so. Uh, next week is uh, the big VMworld conference. Will you be coming back across the pond to be a chance for folks to to pick your brain uh, uh, at VMworld at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm I'm sort of pinch hitting for the uh, for the networking team at, at VMworld this year. So I'm uh, doing a couple of things. I'm I'm doing a breakout session on the future of networking, where I'm uh, sort of trying to talk about some of the things that we're doing at VMware in a broader industry context. So talking a little bit about how networking relates to things like IoT and AI and machine learning, and how that's all driving a different approach to networking. Um, and then the other thing I'm doing is uh, is I'm taking part in the third. Uh, instance of this FutureNet conference, which we run as sort of a, a side event next to VMworld, and uh, this was this was an idea that I, th- I think uh, Martin Casado was the genius behind this to say, you know, we should try to get the the people who are sort of thought leaders in enterprise networking to come together f- for a day or two and and talk about where's networking going, and and so it's it's an unusual conference because it's not an academic conference. Um, it's also not a big trade show. Um, it's sort of a it's a forward looking conference for people who are networking practitioners. Um, and so we've we've now run that for a couple of years, and this will be our third year. So I'm I'm uh, still helping with the arrangements for that, um, and uh, you know I've, I've been making sure that we we bring in you know, really interesting speakers as well as uh, uh, as well as getting a you know a good audience of people who have a lot of influence on the, the networking world. Very cool. Very, very cool. Well, we will get the uh, the links to that in the show notes for folks. Uh, if you get a chance to go, if you're going to be out there next week, definitely um, you know, try and attend. If not, likely we'll uh, have videos. They typically do a great job of, of getting the sessions out somewhere on YouTube fairly soon. So, uh, Bruce, thank you so much for the time today, um, especially from so far away. It's great to get your insight into things. Um, you know, Really appreciate you being on, folks. As always, thank you for listening this week, and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more podcasts, show notes, and everything social media. And visit acloud.guru for all your cloud training needs.